Hello, today we'll be covering voltage and potential difference from a suggestion from a comment. Voltage is one of those concepts that stand alone may be a bit confusing, but if you use relations and related to other known things, it gets a lot easier. So hopefully this video can clear up some things about voltage. Now to begin, voltage is signified by the letter capital V, not to be confused with the lowercase v for velocity. Its units are V for volts, but is also equivalent to joules per coulomb. And this can already tell us a lot about what voltage is. It's the amount of joules or energy required to move one coulomb, or the amount of charge through some sort of potential difference. Let's say that I am one coulomb of charge that moves from a positive terminal to a negative terminal of a 9 volt battery. This gives me 9 joules of energy once I pass through that I can use to power a light bulb or power anything that I go through. Now the method that the battery uses to charge me up to 9 joules is not important in the context of AP Physics 2. For all we know, it could be some magical fairy or something giving it energy, but it is actually a chemical reaction that you don't have to worry about. The important part now is that I am a coulomb with 9 joules of energy that can flow through the circuit. Now imagine a ton of these little me's that are going through the battery and constantly gaining 9 joules each time and powering whatever's through the circuit and coming back and then charging up again. And that is the concept of a flowing circuit. The relationship is given by the equation U equals VQ, or V equals U divided by Q. U is the potential energy, V is the voltage, and Q is the charge. So the 9 volt battery creates a potential difference that transfers joules over to each coulomb, and the amount is determined by the charge and volts. So let's say that I'm a little fatter, and instead of 1 coulomb, I'm 4 coulombs of charge. Now I gain less joules from the potential difference. This gives us a key relationship between AP Physics 1 and 2, since from the voltage and charge we can figure out the potential energy within that charge and therefore the speed. Say that I'm an electron that's being accelerated through a potential difference of 100 volts. Now the important thing to note is potential difference applies to positive charges, and since electrons are negative charged, they'll actually go from lower voltage to higher voltage. So a potential difference could look like 0 volts on the side that I'm on to 100 volts on the other side, and that's the direction that the electron will be going to, or 100 volts on the starting side and 200 volts on the ending side. These are all the same, just as long as the difference is the same. So now the question is assume that I'm accelerated through this voltage, and at the very end, what's my speed? So by utilizing the equation U equals VQ, we can substitute the potential energy for kinetic since it's at the end of the potential difference and there won't be any potential energy left. So we can substitute U for 1 half mv squared, giving us VQ equals 1 half mv squared. Now out of this equation, we know V, but Q and M are still maybe unknown. We're not sure what those are. Well, to find those, we have to remember that an electron always has the smallest charge possible in the physical world or the elementary charge. Now the elementary charge is a known constant that will always show up on your equation sheet. And it's this number, which obviously is an insanely small number. But you don't have to remember it obviously because it's on the equation sheet. Now the mass is going to be the mass of an electron, which is obviously also an insanely small number. This can also be found on the equation sheet as well. So it turns out we actually just know every variable. We just have to isolate velocity, giving us square root of 2vq divided by m. This gives us a total of 3.517 times 10 to the power of 13 meters per second. Now that is a huge number, representing an unreal amount of velocity, and this is actually very common in AP Physics 2, so you want to get used to the scientific notation quite a bit. Now let's move on to another equation found on the equation sheet. E equals V divided by D. This refers to a uniform electric field, where the field strength is the same everywhere. This refers to a uniform electric field, where the field strength is the same everywhere, both in magnitude and direction. It'll look something like this. This means that the field lines are all facing the same way, towards the negative side. So we can see from the equation, the distance of the sources and potential difference between them both play a part in determining how strong the electric field is. If the distance is small, the electric field is stronger. And if the potential difference is bigger, the electric field is stronger. Now you might be wondering how the potential difference works within the field, not just at the ends. Well, potential difference is actually a gradient, one that gradually goes from one end value to the other. Now if you imagine an electron in the middle of it, 
it continually applies a force onto the charge to move it in one direction, towards the place that it's being attracted to. You can think of the uniform field as a downward rail. As I enter the rail as a charge, I'm pushed towards the side that's lower, or if it's an electron, it's higher. Now, as we keep increasing the potential difference, the height between the ends of the ramps becomes higher and higher, making me experience even more force when I ride the rail. This is why increasing the potential difference strengthens the electric field. Now, another equation that involves V is V equals KQ divided by R. An equation that calculates the amount of electric potential felt at one point from the voltage sources around it. This equation deals mostly with point masses, where all the voltage sources around it are point masses, and the place that the electric potential is felt is also at a point. Now for the variables, Q is the charge, and R is the distance between the charge and the point. Now K is a special constant that shows up on the equation sheet once again. It's called the Coulomb constant, and it is this huge number right here. Now based on the equation, you might be able to tell that charges and the charge strength has something to do with the electric potential. And you'd be right. Say I'm the point of calculation and there's three charges represented by the red blocks around me. All of them are protons and they're 5 meters, 3 meters, and 2 meters away. The question is, what is the electric potential at my position? Or how much I'm feeling? Now before you panic and try to figure out which directions are important and Pythagorizing things, it's actually much simpler than you think. Voltage actually has a very special property of being a scalar, which means that magnitude is the only important factor and not direction. So all you have to do to calculate electric potential at a point is to add up all the kq divided by r for all protons, regardless of where they are in relation to each other. Even if they're on opposite sides, you still add them up. We know all the variables, and the charge of each proton will be the elementary charge, so we just add up all the values and only focus on the distance between us and the charges. You would get this equation and just plug in all the values and solve. Now for the last few equations, they're all going to explore voltage within circuits. This will relate more to the first equation we explored with the voltage purpose inside of a battery, like the potential energy thing we discussed. So now let's explore the circuit relations a little further. The most simple one we'll start with, which is V equals IR. This one's Ohm's law and it's very, very common. If we rearrange the equation to I equals V divided by R, the relations are much clearer. The higher the battery voltage, the more current due to the increase in joules through each coulomb. Another way to look at it is to imagine the electric field analogy again. As we increase the voltage of the battery, the potential difference increases, and the electrons are pushed with more and more force, which increases the angle of the ramp and causes me to go faster. Now, voltage also has one more relation with circuits, and that is power. If you remember from last year, power is the rate at which work is done or work over time. This variable is most notably used in determining how bright the light bulb will be or the amount of energy passing through. This variable is dictated by V times I, and you can see how the increase in voltage will also increase the light bulb strength or increase the amount of power. Now one final thing in the circuits part is capacitance. I actually don't want to go capa over capacitance in this video as I have not gone over capacitors as a whole yet, so once that video comes out, I'll just be sure to include voltages role in it. For now, let's go over the potential differences within circuits and what they look like. Now this is a little bit different from the gradient one that you saw in the electric fields, and so a good way to start is to look at the measuring tool for voltage, a voltmeter. A voltmeter's characteristics are quite simple and you'll be using them in a lot of labs, so it's good to learn this. They basically have two rods, and you put the red probe on the positive voltage side and black on the negative voltage side. This will give you a reading, and this is done by getting the differences of voltages on each end. This basically means that if you put both ends on the same wire, you'll get a reading of zero volts, since there's no difference. Now what happens when we have a circuit like this, where there's a light bulb on one side and a battery on the other? And say we put the ends over the light bulb. Well, since one side of the light bulb has all the voltage and the other end has zero, the voltage will simply read the voltage of the battery. This can be quite tricky at times, because if we look at a switch, if the switch is open or off, since there's two different voltages on each side, there will be a voltage reading. But if we close the switch and let the current flow, 
suddenly there's no voltage difference. This will mean that there's no reading on the voltmeter. The general rule of thumb for voltages like these is that wires without anything on them will always have the same voltage. No matter how long the wire is, it will always have the same voltage throughout. Only when there's something like a light bulb or resistor will there be some sort of voltage reading. The very last thing is that voltmeter ends have to have infinite resistance to be ideal. The two probes, the red and black one, have to have infinite resistance and have no current going through. The idea is that there should be no current going through the probes and only the current should be going through the wire to keep it uninterrupted. However, if it's not an ideal voltmeter, it will allow some current to go through the probes but still give an accurate reading. Anyways, that's the end. That's all the information I have. It was a ton of new information, but of course studying and practicing is the key to mastery. Hopefully this just helps clear up some conceptual mistakes maybe you had. So best of luck with your studies and bye bye.